Hello and welcome to The Wine Dude, Tasting As You Go, a podcast for those excited about wine tasting but too poor to be a snob. We're out here in the back roads looking for all the different wineries, places you've never heard of, places we're going to introduce you to. We're going to introduce you and educate you to wines and to show you that it's a lot of fun. So remember, drink what you like and like what you drink. So sit back, pour yourself your favorite glass of wine, and check out The Wine Dude and join me tasting as you go. You'll see when I pour it out, the color is, is fantastic. 
even though this is a grape that has a reputation for not having great color. It's almost as dark as Syrah. I was going to say, it's quite dark. Huh. Because it has great tannins, and because Grenache does not have great tannins, they're very commonly blended. So a real common Rhone blend is Syrah for the color, Movedre for the tannins, and Grenache for the flavor. Is that what we did here? Or is this just a straight? Each of these has been separate. We could have blended them right in the glass for you. <laughs> wow, OK. We're very happy with the Movedre and Grenache. There's not a whole lot of places to grow it uh, as a state wines. We think our quality is good enough that it's going to help us make a name as a winery, uh, not just Rhone varieties, but specifically Movedre and Grenache red wines. OK, so those are the, the special wines that you think will basically put your name on the map. We hope so, among the red wines. Very good. Very good. Warms my heart to hear that. It is. It's very good. Um, you know, we're talking about you're the actual owner of the winery, but you also have a winemaker that is not what we call an orthodox winemaker for California, correct? Correct. I posted a job wanted sign at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa a couple years ago. Got a number of people that responded. One guy, his name's Lud, Lud Kutsia, which I think you'll talk to a little bit later. Uh, he was on site all year doing the bulk of the winemaking for us. A young man, he's about 26 years old, undergraduate in enology, graduate degree in winemaking. Worked for a guy named Teddy Hall in South Africa, who there is a pretty well respected winemaking name, and he'll go back during the off season to make wine again during our winter, their, their growing season, to make wine for anyone else. So Lou is 26 years old, right? Correct. From South Africa, Correct. and he's the one making all these wines. That's correct. That's cool. He made I a, really like that. He made a sparkling wine for us this year. Ah. And as far as I know, uh, outside of Letitia, who's a well known sparkling winemaker here on the Central Coast, nobody else is making sparkling. So we're very excited about the prospect for making one that's not common, it's unusual, 60% Grenache, 40% Viognier, but it's pure, clear as water. With a South African twist. With a South African twist. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> right, cool. So, um, what's next? Uh, let's see, we have the Cabernet. That's the only non rhone variety that we make this year. We'll find out. Back down this aisle. Take it easy up there. Fall off. Standing on the book of It could be worse. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there who would like to say that. This is a Cabernet. It's a combination of, excuse me, that is Clone 337, that one that I pulled out of. Grapes have different, they're like cousins. In this vineyard, we have four different clones of Cabernet, and they're by number. 337, 15, 8, and 4. Different winemakers have different preferences. You'll have one guy say 337 is the best clone, and somebody else who's also a great winemaker will say 4 is the best clone. They have slightly different characteristics and flavors, ripening uh, schedules, and it's kind of personal choice with winemakers which one. Okay. <laughs> That's good. It's not a super strong cap, correct? It's correct. more like a, uh, a soft. Mm -hmm. It's got that buttery feel at the end. We like to make our wine very approachable. So there are techniques, uh, half a dozen different techniques during the winemaking process where you can make a wine that will age really well. But it may not taste that great the first year or two because the tannins are really strong. So it has a little bit of a bite to it. I don't think there's that many people that are buying wine to lay down for 8 or 10 or 12 years. I'm really going for people that drink their wine within 6 months to a year and maybe only 2 weeks right. by the time they buy the bottle. So all of our winemaking processes during the course of the season are to make wine drinkable as soon as possible. Okay. That's but if you age this, it's okay? These, these wines will be good for four to eight years. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I'd recommend it for 12 to 20 years or some of those longer times. Right. So is that it for our reds? Yeah, one more you might want to try. Okay. And it's Cab Franc. Cab Franc. Uh, I had contracted all the Cab Franc to another winery. I ended up renegotiating so I could keep a little bit of it. We were just uh, really happy with the way it was turning out and I hated, hated just give it all away to somebody else. <laughs> so we're gonna pull out some Cab Franc. Yeah. 
Cab Franc is uh, commonly used as a blending wine. You, because it has really good color, if you're going to make a meritage, the technical definition of a meritage, that it's a blend of Bordeaux varieties, which would normally be mostly Cabernet with a little bit of Cab Franc or a little bit of Merlot or maybe one or two other Bordeaux varieties. We're happy enough with this Cab Franc. We're going to do it. Some of it may be blended with Cab, and most of it will be a standalone. It smells very, very good. Very good. I can see where you blend the two, mm -hmm. but this is very good by itself too. There's not too many cab francs are done as a standalone. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, you good with pizza? <laughs> I'd love it with some good red meat. Mm -hmm. Fresh off the grill. Mm -hmm. Fresh off the grill. Fresh yeah. off the grill. Okay, great. So that, that's it for the reds. Okay. We have some white wines. Uh, they're in tanks and in barrels. Uh, they just went in. Of course, they're not aged the way these are. These are just from this last harvest. Uh, I can go and get one out of the other room if you want to try something that's really fresh. Okay, um, is this something we want Lou to talk about? Or? Well, that's a good idea, because he made them. He made them. That'd be great. Let's go find it. Okay, let's go. So, what do we got here, man? Tank next to us is full uh, Rissan. And this one, we actually tried to make two different styles of white at the winery. This is going to be our tank fermented one. Also, this age, the other one is obviously barrel, the barrel white, the Viognier. Uh, yeah, we uh, used the uh, yeast in here that kind of induces more, nut, more the nutty flavors, and we hope to make a unique Rhone style white. Okay, so this is white wine then? Yeah, this is white wine. Rousson? Rousson, yeah. Uh, where do you get the wine this... from, man? You can try a little bit of this. Uh, I forget one of these big things here. <laughs> it's still at a point where it's unfinished, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in this. That's why it's kind of cloudy. Oh yeah, it still needs to be fine and filtered. At this point, you, just, you will get that nice, nice restaurant flowery oh, flavor. Yeah. However, it still needs plenty of work on the palate. It's still, uh, it's still rough. A lot of tannins in there, but uh, we'll fix it in the future. It's got a little bit of kind of bubbly on your tongue there. Definitely, it's got some CO2 still dissolved, and that's what you're tasting there. Okay. So you guys infuse the grape or the wine with it? No, no, no. That's just off, after fermenting. Oh, after fermenting. Bit, yeah, okay. maybe a little bit of malolactic fermentation is still going on in there. That's what creates creating the bubbles. Malolactic fermentation? <laughs> what does that mean? That's the secondary bacterial fermentation, and. Uh, which you basically do in a winery to make the wine uh, microbiologically stable. So okay. you let that run and just let it finish. And this one, however, we're planning to do about 30% of that. So we can, it's going to be stopped at a point. And uh, yeah, it adds another dimension to the flavor profile. Okay, so, great. Yeah. great. It's very flowery oh, yeah. taste and smell. Well, that's that's song. Not a whole lot of Rassan grown around here. and we, We've learned some things about it. It's, it takes a little bit extra work to get it completely dry. So did you guys grow the grapes here? Yeah, uh, all of the wines that are made in this winery come off the vineyard that's right behind the building that you saw as you came in. Oh, okay. Let's have some good wines here. I'm empty. empty. We're ready. More of this. <laughs> no, that's okay. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Tell me what this is. It's a barrel. It's a barrel. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I haven't had that much wine. <laughs> Just so you guys know, this here, this is called the bung, which would make this the bung hole. So uh, Steve was saying he's got to make sure that your bung is always very tight in your bung hole. Another wine do tip. Okay, dude. Okay, this barrel is filled with uh, the O5 Union. And that's the white that we are doing barrel fermentation. Let's try a little bit of that one. And at the moment, what is being done in this wine is uh, it gets a regular stirring of the bees and uh, you get some nice flavors from there and uh, it really adds to the mouthfeel of the wine. So this one, typical of Viognier, we can expect a nice viscous viscosity on the mouth and uh, Perfume nose. Very. Yeah, this V performs really nice. Um, okay, so this is the VNA. Mm -hmm. Still a little bit of work to be done on the fine tuning of the mouth, uh, a little bit of fine 
But I think this is once again, once again going to be a, a good, good vintage for the vineyard. It's very good, very good. So, <laughs> uh, Steve, what are you doing here? <laughs> You're this scaring me. This is the stirring tool. Ah, this stirring This is how tool. you stir up the leaves. You know, the leaves is the stuff that goes to the bottom of the barrel after fermentation. Once a week, we come in with this guy, you stick it in the bunhole. The bunhole? <laughs> just kind of wiggle around like that, and this little plate here gets everything all stirred up. Helps to enhance the flavors. Uh, sounds like the barrel really likes that. <laughs> the difference between what you can do in a smaller winery and what's harder to do in a really big winery. Right. So, uh, we got anything else to look at? We, can, uh, we actually got the, you know, we got the sparkling wine in the back here as well, which is also one of our wines. Sparkling wine? Yeah. So, you yeah. mean like champagne? champagne? Are we allowed to say that champagne? Champagne style wine. Champagne style. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh, since it's not made in Champagne, you, we can't really call it Champagne. Uh, right. It's definitely Champagne style, it's made in the traditional method. And uh, it's, it's really fun to make, that's why we're doing it. Well, show me what you got. This year. Oh, what, what's this? Well, this is uh, the sparkling one that was recently bottled. And uh, basically, the point of the process that it is in at the moment is the bottle fermentation. It should be still be going. What you do is you basically inoculate the wine and bottle it with the yeast going in the bottle and that's how you get the, the, the bubbles in the, in the wine. Okay, so, so we put yeast into the wine uh -huh. to get the bubbles in the wine to get sparkling wine. Uh -huh. So every time I had champagne though, um, I don't, there's no yeast in it. <laughs> well, uh, that's, still, we still, that's still the process that needs to be done this one. You, it's called the gorgement, the process in which you move the, the yeast cells from the bottle to make it a clear wine, like the wine you drink. So that's still to come. This one will have about a year or so of bottle aging and then, uh, then we'll, that will be done. So uh, so what do you do then? How, how do you get that yeast out of that? Let me explain that to you. That's quite a labor intensive job. But what you do is basically the yeast, you call it, the yeast flocculates. As, as, as the sugar uh, runs out in the bottle, the yeast becomes latent and they fall to the bottom. There's a, the process is called riddling and what you do is you gently shake the bottle and you work it to a vertical position. And slowly the yeast moves down to the neck and uh, in order, the way to get it out is you freeze the neck, they're just that bottom bit, and you turn it around and the pressure pushes, pushes the cell out for yeast cells. So, okay, so you freeze it upside down. Upside down, okay. yeast in the neck. And then you can pull the cap off. And turn then it around and the yeast stuck, sticks there, take the cap off and the pressure just shoots up. Ah. That's how you do it. So, so how far do you think that uh, plug of yeast would shoot pop it open? <laughs> Across <laughs> the room? I don't know, let's see. <laughs> Put your eye out though, right? Uh, it might. It might. <laughs> it might. Okay, so yeah. it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. So then you, okay, so it pops the thing out, right? Mm -hmm. It pops out the plug, I guess we'll call it, yeah? Yeah, plug. the plug, yeah. And then what happens? Then, basically, you need to fill the bottle to the right filling position. You stick a cork in there. And you, you do a few additions. If you want a sweet sparkling wine, you can add your sugar there or whatever. Or if some people even have flavorings there. Um, but we're not going to do it that way. We, we, we want to keep it natural. Uh, and you put a cork in there and you put the crown over. And, and that's it. Almost ready to drink. Yeah. Ready to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, Steve. Uh, this is a pretty funky looking barrel here. <laughs> you want to show me what's inside here? This is a, our very last fermentation of this year's harvest. It's a late harvest. We picked it just uh, December 1st. Cold frozen berries. Late harvest wine. Came. Wait a minute, that's not wine. Will be time. What you see is the uh, the must, the top part of the. Uh, underneath this is all the juice. You can kind of see some of the juice over coming through over there. Yeah. With a tool, you could punch that down. You can see there's a lot of juice underneath. It's just starting the fermentation process. Just starting to convert the sugar into alcohol. This is going to be a very high alcohol wine with probably a little residual sweetness, maybe 19 to 21% alcohol. So what type of grapes? This is Cap Franc. Cap Franc. Okay. So this is the stuff you were talking about before. Exactly. Well, it smells, it smells good. Oh yeah. There's some hey. fruit flies in there too. So here's a wine that you uh, wouldn't normally see here with a wine dude. It's going to get there though. We'll be ready. Okay, Steve, what the hell is this thing? Uh, this is the contraption that we use to help us punch down wine. When you're uh, fermenting red wine, uh, the seeds, the grapes, skins float up to the top. 
in order to get the maximum color and flavor extraction, you, there's two things you can do. You can pour wine, out, pump wine out of the bottom over the top and let the wine filter down through, or you can punch down the must into the wine, or do both, which is what we do. We do both of them. Because we're in uh, five-ton tanks, that must gets to be really thick, and it's almost impossible with your hands just to push it down with a hand tool. So we use this guy. Goes onto a forklift. Forklift lifts this up above the tank. We hook this up to air pressure. This guy here, and with this little toggle switch, this foot here is pushed down through the must, and the must is pushed down to the bottom, and then mixed in with the wine to improve the flavors. Ah, okay. Great. Oh, good, cool hat. <laughs> wow. It's a good fit. We're here with Brian Cass. Come on in here, Brian. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? Good. Good. See you. Brian's going to tell us a little bit about the wines here. The first wine we usually pour is our 2004 Viognier. It's uh, got a lot of fruit flavors, a little bit of citrus. Pretty tasty. The next wine we usually pour is our Roussan. This one's a little bit sweeter than a typical Roussan. It's got percent and a half residual sugar, so it's almost like a dessert wine. Next wine we normally pour is our Casanova, which is 50% uh, Movedre and 50% Grenache. First red on our list is the Rockin' One, which is a Grenache Syrah Movedre blend, sometimes called a GSM. It's got uh, mostly Grenache and Syrah, but a little bit of Movedre. It's a wine that'll really age nicely, and it's got a really nice kind of floral nose on it. The next wine we pour is the Hacienda, which is 80% Movedre and 20% Syrah. It's got a lot of fruit characteristics in it. It's a little bit lighter in color than the Syrah. It's really easy drinking red. We've been pouring a lot more of it just the last couple of months than we did at the beginning. This has kind of come into its own in the bottle, but now it's one of our best-selling wines. Final wine that we pour normally is our Cabernet Sauvignon, which has got a 20% straw in it, so it's like an Australian style one. The vines, when we picked it, we're only getting about 100 pounds of fruit to the acre, so it's a really fruit forward cab, and it's really easy to drink. So, uh, where did these grapes come from? Uh, all our grapes are grown here on the vineyard. Uh, we've got 160 acres, and we only used about 10% for the winery this year, so we only did 1,300 cases. The rest will contract out to bigger wineries. Well, what are these here? That is our Late Harvest Cabernet. It's 19% uh, alcohol, 3% residual sugar, and we're selling them here in these two-gallon oak barrels. And the way we're selling them is that you can buy this and get two gallons of Late Harvest, and then refill it three times after you purchase it. A lot of wine to drink, but... So it's like tasty. a free refill, like when you go yeah. and get a Coke and you come back and get another one. Exactly. Wow, and it's full of wine. Yep, <laughs> full of some strong wine. This is a good tasty. idea. <laughs> My grandpa helped us harvest it, and his name's Pete, and we're calling the wine for Pete's sake. <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right, cool. So here we go. Grandpa wine. This is one thing you're not going to see at other wineries, only at Cass. Brian, this is a beautiful tasting room. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, it was, uh, this was originally our barn before it was uh, the tasting room. We built it basically as a storage unit, and then uh, my dad decided about two years ago to start the winery up when he was in South Africa with his uh, our winery partner, Ted. So we try to emphasize outdoor seating here because that's the way they do it in South Africa. So we tell people if they want to take a seat outside or here inside. But you can have a party here? Yeah, we do uh, parties in our barrel room here, up to 75 people. And I also noticed another room uh, that had a whole bunch of wine bottles in it. Yes, that is our bottle room slash event room. We will use that for storage of our red wines and also it's our event room to have private parties, anniversaries, birthdays, that kind of stuff. Okay, so it's kind of your library. Yeah, exactly. You should go check it out. It's pretty nice. Yeah, let's yeah. go do it. Yeah, definitely. Come on. Thanks for joining us in our latest Wine Dude podcast, Cass Winery on the back roads of Paso Robles, California. This place was great. We had a really fun time. I want to thank Steve Cass for his time and his wine. Lewis Kutsia, the 26-year-old winemaker from South Africa. And Brian Cass. 
To get to Cass Winery from Southern California, take Highway 101 North to Paso Robles. Take Highway 46 East, go about four or five miles and turn right on Geneseo Road. Take Geneseo about four or five miles until it dead ends into Lene. Turn right on Lene and they're up ahead a little ways on the right at 7350 Lene Road. You can check out Cass online at www.casswines.com. You can also check out our website at www.thewinedude.com. Download our podcast and help us put The Wine Dude on network TV. Remember, drink what you like and like what you drink. Don't let anyone tell you what's good or what's bad. Trust your own palate and have a good time. And join me, The Wine Dude, tasting as you go. I'm